It's very interesting because there are some parts of, of this market that we see as being idiosyncratic to, say, the US economy and, and some of the, the ways that things are functioning there. But is it possible for you to predict whether we'll continue to just see these waves of volatility as we get closer to normalization when it comes to monetary policy? Sure. Let me make a couple of points about the big uh, Fed pivot that we saw over the last, uh, the last week, because I think it has rippled right across uh, the world. But a lot of people make uh, a number of mistakes in trying to interpret this. First, I think there has been a belief that somehow this means that uh, with a quicker taper and more rate increases expected for next year, that interest rates will go up. And actually, that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, at the short end, we certainly have seen rates begin to rise. But actually, at the long end, we've actually seen yields fall. And uh, we've actually seen the 10-year uh, begin to come down a little bit as well. And Heidi, that we've seen that in the past as we've had some of these little mini taper tantrums along the way. And what the market is saying is that as we get through this, over the next couple of years, the market expects slower growth and we will have lower rates in the future. And so our, our belief, and we've been very consistent on this uh, really over the last seven or eight years, is that we will go back to a period where the 10-year is in, in a period between 1% and 2%, and that we've actually seen the highs uh, as we go through this cycle now. And we've held on to that view, and there's nothing in the last week that really has changed that for us. When you talk about this maniacal search for yield that has really dominated uh, and driven sentiment, right, does that mean you feel like there's a better home for that surge in Asia, that you're more opportunistic on some of the idiosyncratic growth stories here? Well, I think that uh, there's no question that having, um, you know, the punitive uh, rates on cash that we have right now, that we will see a, a absolute focus on yield over the next uh, the next 24 months. And what that means is there's an enormous amount of money that's looking for a home in private credit, in real estate, in infrastructure. Um, and as you put it, in some of the really important markets in Asia, which have both higher interest rates and higher inherent long-term growth rates in their economy. And we are seeing a uh, real interest uh, in, in investing uh, behind those themes. But that, that movement toward privates and toward yield is something that has been strong and we expect to continue uh, for the foreseeable future. What are your expectations out of China? It is such an interesting but also challenging time at the moment. We're looking oh. at this massive debt restructuring for Evergrande. We're looking at easing monetary policy conditions and slowing economic growth. What are you targeting in Greater China? Well, it's really it's really interesting because on the one hand, if you uh, if you read the newspapers, all you see is you know rising political tensions, security issues, um, you know a lot of a lot of I think worry that the world is continuing uh, to divide. But as I travel the world and talk to CIOs of large pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, what I hear is their biggest concern is that they're underweight China that they believe that the economy there over the next decade will continue to grow faster than much of the rest of the world, and that they want to make sure that they're well positioned to capture that excess return. And so we're working with a lot of clients around the world in helping them create differentiated ways to access the China markets, whether or not that's through the public markets or the private markets, so that they make sure that they're well positioned uh, for the next decade in China. So our prediction is, yes, it will be volatile. Yes, there will be political tension. But in a strange sort of way, that just means that there will be more emphasis, really, on the integration of the capital markets that we will see and that we need to play a role in intermediating. But for a very centrally controlled market like China, how do you factor in the political risks? Because at any given moment, they could change their policies. We have seen this crackdown on so many different sectors already in the past year, whether it's property, whether it's tech, whether it's education. So how do you hedge that? I'm not sure there's any good hedge for that at all, Sherry. I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately, investors in China are going to need to take the long-term view. Things do change quickly there. They are uh, inherently unpredictable. But if you look at the growth rates that have happened in that country over the last 30 years, it's actually been a remarkably steep climb. 
And our view is that that is likely to continue. We see a lot of very strong fundamentals. Obviously, growth will come down from the very high levels that it's been at. But we see some strong fundamentals there, which we think will continue to power economic growth. And so uh, many of our clients want to make sure that they're positioned to access it and are willing to accept that they need to ride out some of the short-term volatility. Do you need to factor in the policy divergence that we are now expected to see, given the Fed tapering and also the PBOC now taking a more pro-easing stance, especially, as you said, uh, we have this maniacal search for yield? No, you're, you're absolutely right. And the, and the strange thing is, is of course, as, as the economies diverge in some cases, and let's just take technology as an example, where more and more we're seeing uh, that you used to be able to play China by simply owning Apple or you know, another major technology company that had major sales in China. That's less and less true going forward. So you actually need to be in China investing in the Chinese technology companies. So actually, as the global firms become almost less integrated, it's more important as a portfolio manager that you have that kind of exposure that can be driven by being on the ground invested in Chinese stocks and bonds. And that's really what we're seeing from our clients. Would you say that right now valuations look better, given already that we've seen the political risks being factored in and all of the sell-off that we've seen the past year? Well, I certainly think if you're willing to take the 10-year view and you believe the argument that I laid out about the fundamental intrinsics of the economy, then I, I do think that uh, in China, and indeed we think in many emerging markets, um, that actually uh, there is better value there than there is in some of the, the developed markets, and in particular in, in the United States. Speaking of developed markets, you're also quite constructive when it comes to opportunities in Australia and New Zealand, particularly here in Australia. We're sitting on one of the biggest pension piles in the world. But again, the search for yield, the search for investable, uh, you know, good quality assets remains a bit of a problem, right? What are the opportunities for growth that you see? Well, I think for Australia in particular, and, and I must say I, I, I'm uh, really a great admirer of the system that you, uh, that you have there in terms of the, it's one of the truly uh, only pension systems around the world that uh, is in cash surplus. And I think that's really an important thing to, to, to acknowledge up front. But what that does mean is that there's a great amount of money that's coming in that needs to be put to work. In the past, much of that money has been put to work in Australia. And you are the beneficiaries of a very good infrastructure as, uh, as part of that and a lot of investment in property. But now I think the time is going to be to diversify much more of that outside of the uh, Australian economy. And uh, I think that uh, many uh, asset managers, such as PGM, but there's a wide range of us, are, are going to have an increasingly important role to play in helping the superannuation funds put that money to work in the rest of the world. Crypto. <laughs> we have to get your views on crypto. What role does it play in a balanced portfolio going forward? Uh, and, and how close is it, do you think, to being able to, to, to I guess, minimise the levels of volatility that we continue to see? Well, I, I would be disappointed if you didn't ask about uh, about crypto, given where we mm -hmm. where we are. So we're, we're long-term investors and we're fiduciaries on behalf of our clients. And for us to put uh, an asset class into a portfolio, three things need to be true. Uh, the first thing is that we need to be comfortable that there is an effective regulatory framework that surrounds that asset class. The second thing is that we need to believe that there's an effective store of value and a way of monetizing that in the future. And, and last, we need to be able to understand what the correlation between that asset class is and other asset classes so that we know how it would fit in an investor's uh, portfolio. So at the moment, uh, crypto in general uh, meets zero out of three of those, uh, those criteria. And so we do not use that in our fiduciary uh, accounts for, uh, for clients. That's not to say that it's a bad idea. Um, but it's to say that it's much more of a speculation than an investment. And there's many speculations in the world, and there's nothing wrong with that. But let's not confuse that with how do we effectively put people's retirement savings to work. Now, maybe in the future, if we get a regulatory framework, and perhaps as some of the stability comes to the markets and we get the correlations to be clear, 
maybe a bit like gold did, it will have a role. Mm. But right now, uh, it really doesn't qualify in our view. In fact, when it comes to uh, Bitcoin and also those uh, retail uh, meme stocks as well, we have seen a little bit of downside pressure in the past few months. Uh, when it comes to 2022, what do you think uh, the outlook will be, especially when it comes to risk appetite for some of these speculative trades? So my, my hope is that uh, in many ways, cryptocurrency has uh, gotten all the attention but it's actually the least interesting part of the innovation. So behind crypto stands a really interesting technology, which is the disaggregated approach to actually holding large sources uh, of stored value in a disaggregated way. And that is, I think, really interesting and really important. And much of the financial plumbing that we have, what we use now when banks and custody services, what we do for clearing and settlement, actually can use blockchain uh, technologies over the next decade. And so my hope for 22 is that in some ways, some of the focus that's been on currency will actually come back to what's really the important innovation, which really is this these disaggregated ways uh, of managing large, complex systems of information without a single counterpart. And that's mm -hmm. really quite exciting.